Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's begin today's session of comprehensive news analysis with the first article today written by Mr. Rangarajan, who is a former chairman of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council and a former governor of the Reserve Bank of India, and Mr. D. K. Srivastava. Both of these well renowned economists in the country. The article here says that the government, in order to achieve the projection of growth given by the RBI and the IMF of 9.5%, must focus on increasing its capital expenditure. The authors here say that the growth numbers that we saw in the first quarter of this financial year should not be taken on face value. As per the authors, because the last year's growth in the first quarter was extremely low, the base with reference to which we are calculating our growth in this year's first quarter was extremely low. That is why the key is now for the government to maintain this growth rate in the coming quarters of this particular year. The National Statistical Office recently released the data of this financial year's second quarter about the GDP numbers and the gross value added. It indicates that India is in the phase of economic recovery. However, our recovery is not going at a pace that we saw in the first quarter of this financial year. And that was mainly because the base of last year's first quarter was extremely low. In fact, as per the authors, if you combine the first two quarters of this financial year and then compare it with the 2019 level, you would see that we are even below the 2019 level of growth. Thus, we must not believe the high growth numbers that we are seeing because we have a lot of recovery to do. The authors say that there are only four sectors right now that are performing better than the 2019-20 level. That is agriculture, electricity, gas and related aspects, mining and querying and public administration and defense and other related services. Most of these sectors have been doing well because the government has focused a lot on capital expenditure in these sectors, especially with respect to public administration and defense. In fact, the central government's capital expenditure grew by over 38% in the first half of the 2021-22 financial year. As a result of which, there has been a considerable amount of infrastructure building across the country which is why the gross fixed capital formation has shown a positive growth. But again, the overall demand in the economy is still lower as compared to the 2019, that is a pre-pandemic level. And the only way to make it up is to increase the private consumption by giving people more jobs and a better income. Both the IMF and the RBI has projected that India's annual growth rate for 2021-22 should be 9.5%. However, our growth in the second half of 2021-22 in order to achieve this particular target has to be 6.2% and we will have a hard time in achieving that number. The authors here are also giving the probable solution to this problem. As per the authors, the only way out of this is for the government to increase its capital expenditure. The good part about this particular situation is that at least the government's tax earning is increasing. The total tax revenue has grown by 64.2% in the first half of 2021-22. That means the government does have money in its pocket at least right now to continue spending on building of infrastructure. Every month in the past 5 months, the GST collection has remained over the benchmark of 1 lakh crore. In fact, last month, the GST collections were at 1.31 lakh crore, which is much better than expectations. This means that the idea of increasing capital expenditure is not an unrealistic idea and can be achieved by proper planning as per the authors. Now, I'm sure most of you are aware of what exactly is capital expenditure. But if not, let's just go through what exactly do we mean by capital expenditure. Now, in the budget that the government of India presents in the parliament, there are two main components, revenue budget and the capital budget. Capital budget, again, consists of capital receipts and capital expenditure. In simple terms, capital expenditure is the expenditure made by the government for the long run, that is for building of infrastructure mainly. Not for giving salary or giving pensions, but this is a long-term expenditure which results 
in some visible infrastructure being created for the long run. For example, building of roads, building of bridges, flyovers, factories, machines, all of that comes into capital expenditure. The more capital expenditure that the government does, the more job opportunities it would be able to create because more people would be involved in building of roads, infrastructure, etc. And it would help the country in the long run. Capital receipts, on the other hand, is the money that the government receives mainly by selling its capital infrastructure. For example, the money that the government receives by selling is its assets, by selling the shares of a company or the money that the government receives in the form of borrowing of loans come under capital receipts. Now, more the capital expenditure that the government indulges in, more will be the participation of labor, more jobs will be given to the people and people will be employed in different sectors. Unlike capital expenditure, Revenue expenditure does not create any asset or does not reduce the liability of the government. Salary, pensions, interest payments on the debt that we have taken, all of that comes under revenue expenditure, which is recurring in nature. Capital expenditure is not recurring. You would not build the same road time and time again. Once it is built, it will sustain over a long period of time. That is why the authors here point out that capital expenditure is necessary to revive the economy. And the government also realizes the same. That is why a few months back, the government of India announced that they will be giving 15,000 crore rupees to the state governments specifically to spend in the form of capital expenditure. This money will be given to the states in the form of 50 year interest free loans, mainly for their capital projects. The name of the scheme is Scheme of Financial Assistance to States for Capital Expenditure. Last financial year also, the government announced that they will be giving 12,000 crore rupees to the states for spending in the form of capital expenditure. This 15,000 crore rupees includes 2,600 crore for the Northeast and the Hilly states, 7,400 crore rupees for the other states and 5,000 crore rupees to the states to help them monetize and recycle their already existing infrastructure assets. The next article that we have talks about the Russian government trying to play the role of a broker between India and China. The article here tells us that Vladimir Putin, right after his visit to India, held an online summit with the Chinese President Xi Jinping, in which he briefed the Chinese leadership on his discussions in Delhi. Not just this, the Russian officials have indicated that there may soon be a trilateral summit with the leaders of Russia, India and China participating in it. That is the RIC summit, which was last held in 2019. Thus, there are enough indications that Russia wants to play the mediator role in between China and India and wants to ease off the problems that the two countries are facing. However, the problem is that we are not getting any positive signs from the Chinese side. The Chinese aggression at the line of actual control still exists right now with the two armies facing each other at the border. The last face-to-face -face meeting of Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping was at the Mamallapuram summit, after which the leaders have not met face-to-face. -face. Since April 2020, the two leaders have not even spoken to each other directly and a lot has happened since then. Although there have been meetings between the two foreign ministers, however, the promises made to the Indian foreign minister by the Chinese counterpart have still not been fulfilled since the Chinese army is still holding its position at the border. On the other hand, the India-Russia relations have improved considerably with the Indian government going ahead with the S-400 missile defense system despite the threat of sanctions being imposed by US under their CATSA law. However, we must understand that the growth of Russia-China relationship has been very, very fast. Meaning that if it comes to Russia playing the role of a mediator between India and China, we should not expect Russia to be completely neutral. The growing affinity between Russia and China is a cause of concern for India. China is one of the largest investors in Russian oil fields and has even signed a 30-year deal of $400 billion gas pipeline with Russia. Thus, Russia right now would do anything to remain in the good books of China. Thus, even if an official offer is made by Russia to play the mediator role, India must assess that extremely carefully before going ahead. 
that is what the article says that expecting russia to play the role of an honest broker would be trusting them blindly and we must take all the necessary precautions now we all know that russia can play an extremely important role in the bilateral relations between india and china but very often we ignore the growing proximity between russia and china themselves let's have a look at their bilateral relations with keeping india out of it for a moment to understand how the two countries are growing close to each other with every passing day ever since russia annexed crimea from ukraine it has been facing western sanctions since those western sanctions have been imposed russia has turned towards china to revive its trade as a result the bilateral trade between the two sides has doubled and has reached over 100 billion dollar just a reminder that india russia trade is still only about 10 billion dollars not just this the russian central bank has increased its chinese currency reserves from less than 1% to over 13% which is an indication of the russian central bank showing a lot of faith and confidence in the chinese economy and the chinese currency china also surpassed germany as a principal supplier of industrial plant and technology into russia now interestingly russia right now enjoys a trade surplus with china but experts say that in the long run china will reverse that very easily that is because most of its export to russia are now higher technology level which will cost much more as discussed earlier the two sides signed the agreement by the name of power of siberia which is a 400 billion dollar deal over 30 years under which gas will be supplied to china from the far east zone of russia with a 1800 miles long pipeline thus as you can see russia right now is a lot dependent on china for its own economic revival and if given a choice it would certainly choose china over india that is a warning sign for india as well the next article that we have here talks about the right of the disabled citizens in the country and their right to have a police which is understanding of their issues the article is written in light of the recently released draft accessibility guidelines by the Ministry of Home Affairs as per the recently released guidelines the Ministry of Home Affairs has ordered the police stations prisons and disaster mitigation centers to ensure that all their infrastructure is friendly to the disabled people and they don't have any problem in accessing these government facilities the fact that disabled people face more discrimination than other citizens is no secret the supreme court also recently in a case concerning rape of a blind scheduled caste women said that as the facts of this case make painfully clear women with disabilities who inhabit a world designed for abled bodied are soft targets and easy victims thus it is a sign for the government to spring into action and ensure that an even playing field is created between those who are physically disabled and those who are not the authors here elaborate about the guidelines that are issued by the ministry of home affairs they point out the positives as well as the negatives in the guideline as per the guideline all the spaces and services must be barrier free by design and people with disability should not have any problem in approaching them thus they deserve equal rights as compared to the others not just the new buildings the guidelines say that the existing police stations and the prisons should also be more gender sensitive and accessible and there should be websites and institutions that should also be much more friendly to the disabled people even the details that we usually skip that is having toilets that are disabled friendly should also be kept in mind the guidelines also say that the police staff on civil duty could have people with disability because having more people with disability in the police force will make them much more aware of the troubles that these people face and they will be much more sensitive towards them however there is an inconsistency here because in august 2021 the government of india's department of empowerment for people with disability said that in the indian police service the delhi andaman nicobar islands lakshadweep daman and diu dadra nagar haveli police service and in the indian railway protection force these services have been exempted from this reservation 
although there is a 4% reservation for them. So these draft guidelines suggesting that people with disability should be in the police go against government's own notification. Next, the authors also point out some of the lacunas in these guidelines. First, the cover letter of the entire document is in the form of a photo. Now, what is the problem with that? See, if you know any blind person, they usually use a software called the screen reader. So how does a blind person use a laptop or use a computer? When they open up a computer or when they open up their laptop, there is a software that reads out to them what is written on the screen. That software is called screen reader. But screen reader cannot read from a photo. Whatever is written in the photo cannot be read. Whatever is written in the form of a document will be read by the screen reader. So the guidelines here, the very first page of the guidelines is in the form of a photo which they will not be able to read, which is a very big problem. Secondly, not enough thought has been given to visually challenged people. So for example, when you see a toilet which is reserved for disabled people, you will usually see a photo outside the toilet indicating that it is meant for disabled. But if a visually blind person is in that area, how will that blind person come to know that this is the toilet that I have to go to? Thus, certain auditory services should also be included there so that the visually blind people can understand where they are going. Thirdly, these guidelines are only recommendary in nature. Meaning that until there is a proper law formed on these guidelines, they will not be mandatory and may not be followed at all. Now, you might know some people who are physically disabled or who are blind. Let me give you a very real life example. There is an app on Android, which I also personally use. The name of the app is Be My Eyes. What you can do is you can download the app, register yourself, tell your language and the region where you are. So what will happen is this is an app used by blind people. If a blind person needs certain help, they will use a button on their phone and a call will go to all those people who has this app. So for example, if you pick up the call, you can see the camera of the phone of the blind person and the blind person can ask you for help and you can help him. So a blind person basically calls me and says that I've dropped my soap on the floor or I have dropped something on the floor. Can you please see it? So they will show the camera and I will tell them, please go right and left and you can pick it up from here. Similarly, a blind person called me showing me his Aadhaar card on the camera and asked me, can you please tell me the number of my Aadhaar card? I have to tell someone. So this is the kind of initiative that people in the private sector have been taking. You can also use this app and you can also help people through this app. Now, what has the government been doing? Let's look at the facts about disabled people in India. As per the 2011 census, so the last official census that we had had, in India, the population of disabled people is about 26.8 million, means above 2.5 crore, which make up 2.21% of India's population. However, their representation in the parliament and in the state assembly is almost zero. Till date, over seven decades after India's independence, we have only had four parliamentarians and six state assembly members who have suffered from visible disabilities. Not just this, 45% of such population is illiterate, which makes them even harder to build a career for themselves. Studies have shown a direct relation between disability and poverty. A large number of people with disabilities are usually born in poor households, mainly due to the fact that when the women are pregnant, poor families don't really take good care of themselves, even in case of medical complications. Data also shows that 69% of total people with disability in India reside in the rural areas, again pointing towards the fact that lack of medical facilities may increase the population of physically disabled people. Although we do have laws and policies in India, but they have not been extremely effective. The government runs the Accessible India campaign under which the government buildings should be disabled friendly. But again, that has not been translated on ground. In 2016, the Rights of People with Disability Act was passed, which provided reservation for people with disability in government jobs and higher education institutions. But most of these posts are still vacant. Let me tell you some other provisions of this law. 
this 2016 law said that 21 types of people would be considered as disabled. Earlier, they were only seven. You can see the list of this 21. It includes cerebral palsy, speech and language disability, thalassemia, sickle cell disease, blindness, low vision, etc. This law increased the reservation for people suffering from disability from 3% to 4% in government jobs and from 3 to 5% in the higher education institutions. Not just this, child suffering from disability from the age of 6 to 18 years will have the right to free education. For others, free education is given from 6 to 14 years. These were some of the important provisions of this particular act of 2016. The next article that we'll talk about is the governments of India's decision to focus on the semiconductor mission. As you know, recently, the union cabinet decided to put aside 76,000 crore rupees and support the development of semiconductors and display manufacturing ecosystem in the country. As you know, ever since the COVID pandemic has hit, there has been a global shortage of chips in the world. So much so that everything that uses chips in the market is running low on supply. For example, if you go and try to buy a car right now from any company, Tata, Maruti, Hyundai, Kia, most probably you will have a waiting period of four to five months right now because the car companies don't have enough chip supply to manufacture their cars. Thus, the Indian government sees an opportunity here to convert India into a manufacturing hub for the chip and display industry. Right now, most of these manufacturing companies are based out of Taiwan, South Korea, US, Japan and China. In India, most of the supplies of the chips happen from Taiwan and South Korea. The article, however, says that it is much easier to say that we will set up such kind of a manufacturing ability, but in reality, it is going to be extremely difficult. The challenges are that it needs a huge amount of capitals to set up such manufacturing plants. The semiconductor fabrication facility costs billions of dollars to set up even on a very small scale. The government of India has announced that we will include this in the production link incentive scheme and only 50% of the cost will have to be given by the company while the government will provide 50% of investment for setting up at least two greenfield semiconductor manufacturing facility. However, the government's announcement of setting aside $10 billion for this does not seem to be enough. Not just this, these kind of manufacturing centers also require millions of liters of clean water and extremely stable power supply. Thus, the article here says that rather than focusing on manufacturing these high-end chips, maybe our focus should be to make India in leader in other parts of this chip making chain rather than just manufacturing them. For example, designing them can be a good way forward since it does not require a lot of investment and India already has talent in that particular field. Now, there are many other components of India's semiconductor mission, which the article does not mention. So let's look into that. There are five main components. First, as we discussed, the government shall provide 50% support of the project cost for setting up at least two greenfield manufacturing labs. Not just this, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology will take steps for modernization and commercialization of semiconductor lab. The existing lab facilities for semiconductor manufacturing will also be renovated. The government is also ready to provide incentive of up to 50% for eligible expenditure and product deployment over the next five years. The government is hoping to support at least 100 domestic companies who are involved in the semiconductor design and chip making. The program also includes giving training to 85,000 well-trained engineers and providing them opportunities to launch their own startups at the expense of the government. As you can see from the graph, the leading chip manufacturer is US, but most of the US chips are consumed in US and Europe only. Then we have South Korea, Japan, EU, Taiwan and China. As I said earlier, Taiwan makes up most of our delivery of the semiconductor chips. Before I discuss the next article, just a small disclaimer. A lot of words that I will be telling you in this article are from the Tamil language. 
since i am not very fluent in tamil maybe some words may be mispronounced by me so i apologize in advance for that so this news article is about the state government of tamil nadu announcing that from now onwards a tamil thai vastu will be their state song officially and whenever it is played in any government office the people except pregnant women and differently able should stand up in respect of that song the article also says that as per the government the song will be compulsorily sung at the beginning of events organized by all the educational institutions government offices and public sector enterprises the song should be sung in 55 seconds in mulaipani ragam also known as a mohan ragam now this development is not all of a sudden there has been a case ongoing in the madras high court for a few years now after which the government of tamil nadu had to take this step what was the case exactly a few years back a petition was filed by nam tamilar kachi which can be translated as we are tamilians party so they filed a petition against a priest in the kanchi math they said that during a function in chennai when this particular song that is tamil thai vastu when it was played he did not stand up everyone else was standing but he was the one who was showing disrespect thus this party filed a case against this particular priest of the kanchi math the high court however said that this is a prayer song and not a state anthem and thus you do not have to necessarily stand up for it if it would have been the official anthem then you could have forced a priest to stand up but because it is just a prayer song you cannot force anyone to stand up for it the court said that the government of tamil nadu itself had earlier said that this song which has been taken from the famous tamil drama manon mayam should be sung as a prayer song at the commencement of all the functions of the government departments local bodies etc thus the government's own notification has called it a prayer song and not an anthem and that is why we cannot take this case forward the court also referred to a very famous supreme court judgment of 1986 in which the supreme court had said that there is no law that forces anyone to sing the national anthem so when there is no law to force anyone to sing the national anthem how can we say the same about the state anthem after the madras high court judgment the tamil nadu government came up and said okay if the court is depending on the government notification only let us give a new notification so from today onwards we are saying that this particular song will be the state anthem and you would have to stand up compulsorily except pregnant women and people with disability now controversies with regards to states and national anthems is not new also understand that tamil nadu is not the first state to have their own official state anthem multiple states in india like rajasthan madhya pradesh uttarakhand do have their own official state anthems with respect to the national anthem also there has been a lot of debate we have the prevention of insults to national honor act of 1971 which prohibits anyone from insulting country's national symbols like the national flag constitution national anthem and the map of india anyone showing disrespect to these symbols will be punished and imprisoned even part 4a of the constitution which talks about the fundamental duties says that indian citizens must abide by the constitution respect the ideals and institution national flag and the national anthem now the 1986 supreme court case that we referred to is a very important case in this matter and it is also called the national anthem case so in 1986 the education department of kerala state government issued a notification saying that every day in schools before the classes begin national anthem must be sung in the assembly and the whole school should join in the collective singing now after this notification there were three children belonging to a small religious group called the jevonas witnesses they said that we will not sing the anthem because it goes against our religious belief to sing the national anthem these three students were expelled from the school on these grounds the supreme court however came to their rescue and said that the circular is unconstitutional 
and they cannot be forced to sing the national anthem. The court said that it goes against their right to freedom of speech and expression. Since the right to remain silent is also a part of right to freedom of speech, it also violates their right to profess their own religion. The court said that not singing the national anthem does not mean that they are insulting the national honors, and that is why they should not be punished. If any fundamental right has to be restricted, it cannot be restricted just by passing a circular of a government department. We need an act of the parliament to do the same. However, Supreme Court also has given multiple directives in this regard. In 2016, the Supreme Court made it mandatory to play national anthem in cinema halls before the screening, adding that all the people who are present are obliged to stand up and show respect to the national anthem. However, the court took back this order in January 2018. Do understand that all these provisions are only for national anthem. As far as the National Song of India is concerned, the Constitution of India does not make any mention of the National Song. Even the fundamental duties don't refer to the National Song. They only refer to giving respect to National Flag and the National Anthem. These were the articles we wanted to discuss on today's Hindu newspaper. Now a couple of practice questions. Number one, do you think the government of India has been spending enough money on infrastructure development in the country? Comment. Also list the advantages of increasing capital expenditure. Second question. Discuss the potential of India's semiconductor mission in reviving India's manufacturing sector. Both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching the video.